at some point. Mm -hmm. But hi, Arpane and Idris. And, uh, hi. Hello. I, I'm glad to be back after a long time. <laughs> yeah, well, great. And Arpane, it's always uh, nice to see you. You're a very Thank good you. note taker, Arpane. Uh, <laughs> or a good listener. I don't know which. You know. I've been uh, eagerly following your YouTube videos. The timing doesn't work because exactly this time I'm usually busy every week. Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, I've been following and watching and learning. Thank you very much, each one of you. Okay, great. I see uh, every once in a while, uh, I, 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 I was wondering, guess who's here? Kevin is here, I think. We haven't yeah, seen hi, Kevin everyone. for Hello, a long you. time. Hey, Kevin, how you doing? doing? I'm fine, thanks. I'm just uh, home, uh, back in Philippines. Yeah, a long time. I've missed you guys. Uh, well, just... we miss you too. I mean, you're a, a real fixture. But um, anyway, this is uh, one, one thing. Uh, you know, I never cease to be... Hi, Jan, too. And, and uh, Tim is here and uh, Annette's here. Hi, Annette. I, I never cease to be amazed by, uh, you know, Young said about uh, Marie-Louise von Franz told Barbara Hanna one time, he says, you know, she's a genius, don't you? <laughs> she's just, she, hi, Tim. Yeah, uh, she always uh, just never disappoints. And, you know, it's just, uh, that's one of the problems with this book. Um, there are so many invitations in it to enter life if we just uh, comprehend what she's saying. It's just uh, incredible. I mean, the way she, that she puts this, I mean, every one of these chapters has been really the description in a fairy tale form, Matt, of, of, of how to enter life successfully, you know, or how to, it's, it's not very, uh, um, straightforward, but at least uh, there's hints, you know. Now, uh, you know, lectures six, seven, and eight are describing like case material uh, that uh, she's had uh, that had to do with, uh, you know, in other words, patients that she worked with that had to, to um, seem to have the Poer problem. And uh, um, she concentrates on one in particular, and that's the one uh, that I thought, uh, I thought we'd just spend two uh, sessions on six, seven, and eight. So uh, today we'll cover most of seven, but uh, we're gonna be discussing um, this person who lives in a tent, you know, that she, uh, that visited her. He kept saying he was going to come and he, that he was going to come and he was going to come. And he would wear, he was kind of a blonde, blue eyed guy who wore a hoodie, you know, everywhere he went, lived in a tent and uh, uh, outside of her in a park, seemed to always live in a tent. She, she said he was like a bird who, who would alight from here and there very tall, blonde, blue-eyed, afraid of borders, uh, border crossings. And so, uh, you know, she says in Europe that if you're afraid of border crossings and he was afraid of the police, you know? And uh, uh, so she, he kept sending her these emails that he was gonna come. She would set aside time for him, he wouldn't come. And he, she did this a couple of times. And then the, the next time he requested it, she didn't even bother to set up the time. And of course, that's the time he comes, you know? So it's, it's very interesting, but um, you, you know, you, the number six, lecture six kind of tells his biography, but I thought just so we could just spend a couple sessions on the case material, this one and the next one. And then on the third, on, on the session following the next one, we'll start on, um, on uh, the uh, kingdom without space because, but you know, I really think this, just these three things are so packed full of in, unbelievable invitations to myself on, uh, 
on, on what's wrong with me, what I, uh, you know, uh, how, why I'm one-sided, you know, um, what to do. I mean, it, to at least know that you're one-sided. But to, to start this, I thought I'd, I'd just start with the little alchemical uh, poem that she put in there. Heavens above, heavens below, stars above, stars below. All that is above also is below. Grasp this and rejoice. Now this has a lot to do with the puer. And we're going to find this out. So that was just kind of the introduction to this um, blonde hooded man who lives in a tense dream. By the way, I guess that let, let's go over how the dream happened. He, the, he, there was a woman that he loved from afar. Okay. And she, um, uh, she, he mentioned that to kind of his shadow friend, a friend of his that was, had no problem interacting with him. So he mentions to him that wouldn't it be nice to uh, spend time with this woman? And so they create, and she was uh, way above them in station. And she create, they create kind of a, a scheme or not a, a, just invite her somewhere. And then the shadow man uh, uh, beds down with her. You know, and then of course after it, he has he doesn't want anything to do with him. So, in other words, this cowled man who can't interact with the woman on a real basis has his shadow to perform in real life. You know, and so she leaves, and uh, but then he still corresponds with her, and then they they get together and they live together for three weeks. It was the only time in his life that he seemed, his problem seemed to go away. But he, uh, but he still just like a bird without any explanation, you know, just some, one day abandons her. And uh, Von Franz mentioned to her, he says uh, that, um, you know, you might want to consider staying with her. And then he gets really angry with her because he thinks she's a matchmaker, a witch matchmaker. Uh, you know, but then he agrees that maybe there's something correct about it. So she, he, um, or she, he writes a letter to her, but he's afraid to mail it to her. And then the same day he gets a mail, a letter from her that it was almost the same letter. I mean, there was just this wonderful synchronicity. So they, so they get together, they go bicycling all day. They, they stop beneath the tree and uh, they uh, um, just kind of, he falls asleep in her arms. And uh, uh, he then has this dream, okay? And uh, hi, hi, John, we're just getting started here. You haven't missed much. What we're gonna do right now is we're gonna read the dream that this Poeri Turnus, this classical Poeri Turnus man, who was one of von Franz's patients, uh, has while he falls asleep in this arms of this woman who was very balanced, well, where he was unbalanced. The dream was that he was standing at the edge of a cliff and he looks down and there's white cliffs on both sides of the valley. And at the bottom of va the valley, were heavens with the skies and the stars. Heavens above, heavens below, stars above, stars below. Uh, it, it is uh, um, not water or earth, but the sky and stars. That's the bottom of this valley that she said looked like the Grand Canyon in a drawing that he did. Um, he, he crawled down very slowly towards the valley bottom. Remember, James Hillman tells us the valley, the veil of tears is the place where you meet soul. You know, this is where soul resides. So he makes, uh, now he's trying to slow his descent because he seems to be almost falling into it. 
and he does it by making bicycling movements. Well, he just had an all-day bike ride, you know, and uh, so he's he's while uh, they, while he's falling, he makes movements to keep himself from descending too fast. Um, there was a certain amount of anguish, and a little he was a little afraid of what was happening, but he was still somewhat in control of the situation. He had a feeling that something was near him, but it was very blurred, and he thought it might be a dog. And suddenly there was a sort of explosion and welling up in, in uh, it uh, was an enormous burst of light. Um, and the light spot was quite flat and he had the feeling that he was absorbed in it, but he continues to fall down through the air. And there comes a change in the dream when the whole thing disappears, okay, the, the, the stars below. And uh, they now he sees rectangles that look like crops that you might see from an airplane and uh, um, quadrangular patterns um, that uh, uh, but there's no trees and then there comes another shift in the same landscape at the bottom of the valley is stagnant water and uh, the water was gray and dirty and didn't reflect anyone's uh, uh, face. And he wakes up and says to himself, I think he wakes up in the dream, I am not afraid, but the water is a symbol of the mother and I don't want to fall into that. It's like ice at the bottom of the valley and it doesn't mirror. And he says this twice, he's still afraid. And suddenly another spark of light appears at the bottom of the valley. It's quite round, but the borders are a bit blurred and it explodes like a soap bubble. In the spot, he sees a skull. And uh, he says, what does death mean here? He's not terribly afraid, but he's still falling slowly at the same spot. And uh, she says, this is a paradox of uh, the dream, that even though he's, he's in, a, in a stationary spot, he still feels that he's falling. You know, and it kind of reminded me of uh, this, you know, Parsifal. This is from the Grail. Parsifal, I scarcely move, yet swiftly seem to run. And the Grail King says, my son, thou seest here space and time are one. So even though he's just standing there, he's still falling into the uh, abyss. And uh, um, so, and he sees the skull, all right? Now, uh, then the whole thing disappears again, and it is uh, replaced by a floor covered with linoleum. <laughs> you know, a linoleum covered floor at the bottom of the valley, and it was yellow with brown spots. First, there was the sky with the light stars, and now it's uh, yeah, uh, linoleum with, that's yellow with dark spots. So the landscape has lost its gigantic proportions. And he asked himself, what would a piece of linoleum be doing at the bottom of the valley? It's really surreal. I mean, first he wants to know what death is doing there. Then he wants to know what linoleum is doing there. He can see it all very clearly, laughs a little bit about the idea of linoleum, which he didn't like. It's cold and not aesthetic. So now what she's saying, and this is what the next two periods are going to be about, is talking about this dream, is um, how it is ab um, describes the problem of the puer in a nutshell. So, um, and it's going to be, it's quite a profound explanation, and it's got such wonderful clues to just being alive, I think. You know, um, it, it contains... Uh, one who has to come down into life, which he's doing, you know. Uh, she says usually in landscape dreams, especially ones worked out with so much detail and so much love, as in this case, can be said to be a soulscape. It mirrors the dreamer's psyche, the certain moods, or contains certain psychological atmospheres. 
and they're the, just the, the landscape, the mood, and the psychological atmosphere of the dream, the landscape, the soulscape, um, uh, is a description of the, his psychological situation. He's come to the edge. He's come to the end. He can't go any farther in the way he was going. He could not go on as before. Now, a split the canyon. A split had occurred in his psyche, and it was a very deep one. And one split, not several, as in a schizophrenic, uh, you know, who's... Uh, she says, whose earth of conscious reality is falling apart. They're just one big canyon. So she says, that's, a, that's hopeful because there's only one big problem. And it's behind his border frontier phobia and the whole structure uh, uh, is uh, of his um, being afraid of policemen who would put him into prison. And uh, she says, uh, but the idea when he has to go over the border into another country. Now, this is kind of what the um, canyon represents. It's his border crossing phobia comes to the edge and his bicycling and going down into it is, is going into this, uh, what she says, what he, what he projects on a border uh, crossing is the idea that he's go going to fall into a hole and his into in his psyche he's going to fall into a hole and uh, the prison phobia is was uh, she says seems very obvious too he never gets pinned down to earth anywhere with a girl or a profession doesn't even stay in the same uh, town very long but wanders about with his tent so prison is a symbol to him. And so is the border crossing, these psychological holes of the negative mother complex in which despite his phobia, he sits in all the time. That's where he sits. He sits in his own prison of the mother complex. He needs to be put, he needs to be put in a prison that's not the mother complex, the prison of reality. For if he runs away from the prison of reality, he's in the prison of the mother complex. So he's got two choices, either enter reality and be in prison or enter reality and be in the prison, or, or not enter reality and be in the prison of the mother complex. So that's uh, kind of what the, the cliff, the fact that he can't go any farther and that he's looking down into what we, is seems like a border crossing, you know, um, this, I think came up in the living symbol where this woman comes up to a border and then the guard tells her she can't go cross because she's too late, you know? So the, the, anyway, it's prison anywhere he turns. So he has only the choice of two prisons of his neurosis or his reality, the fate of the Puer Eternus. And it's up to him which prison he prefers, the mother complex, or the just so story of earthly reality. So um, what he's he's being confronted with here in the dream is his inner split and slowly falling. And while doing so, he uh, is uh, um, you know trying to slow the rate of his following, falling with bicycle movements, keeps moving. And he so he doesn't just passively sink into this situation. Uh, the fall is slowed down. So when he falls into the inner split, split, depression or inner accident, ego is still present and it is trying to control the fall. So he's not just falling uncontrollably, you know. So uh, the... Hey, Craig? Yes, yes, go ahead, Tim, please. So in the text, it says there might be a se sexual implication in the bicycling movement. What do you think oh, that's about? Yes, I was, um, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but um, uh, we're definitely going to discuss the set. She doesn't say, does she, what that refers to, as far as I know, does she? She just says it could also be sexual. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm and just, I'm, 
Yeah. I just um, find that a little confusing. I'm not. I do too. I mean, that's why I didn't even mention it. I mean, oh. <laughs> it, no, I'm not saying it's not important, but I didn't, I didn't get it. And I'm just sorry. I didn't, I, I really was trying to figure that out myself. I mean, maybe somebody else has some ideas what that would mean, but I mean, uh, it, it could mean somewhat um, a libidinal movement through libidinal movement. He slows his fall. So, so some instinctive movement. Now we're going to talk in absolutely a beautiful fashion very soon about instinct and archetype, you know, and uh, will, uh, and the relationship, and this is Tim, what I was thinking too, is the relationship between the conjunctio, the marriage of soul and God, and the sexual uh, 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 conjunctio, that they're related, okay? That the, the, the instinct behind the conjunctio of the soul marrying the God is the instinct behind it is the sexual uh, act of mating, which is very interesting. You know, it really is. I mean, the, just the mystery of it, what she calls the mystery of the living organism. And, you know, one thing I'm uh, uh, having great fun with here uh, when I started this, um, my I just restarted analysis was uh, doing this, um, uh, this uh, um, cranial sacral therapy. You know, I've done several sessions now and uh, it is just, you know, you know, my wife says, well, what do they do? Is it a massage? No, you know, basically you just go into a trance and they're just highlighting certain chakras, you know, I mean, it's, it's and, and, you know, it, it really is a, is a very uh, trance-like experience. And it is definitely what it does is it takes the seat of consciousness and spreads it out through the whole body. You know, I mean, it's very interesting. And that's what she's, this Renata Daniel uh, is someone who emphasizes psychosoma, that the self, the archetype of wholeness is in the body. It's not outside the body. So this instinct and archetype are very, very closely related, you know, but um, and, and anyway, uh, we'll just keep, uh, we'll move to that uh, pretty quickly because I think it, what, what you're getting, what are you're hinting at there, Tim, is uh, uh, very important, okay. And and anyone else who wants to jump in, go ahead. Uh, I'm gonna try to get through this stuff pretty quickly here. Um, so he's confronted with this inner split. He's slowly falling. Uh, so sometimes she says it is possible to bridge a dangerous moment with ego initiative. Sometime type, and so he doesn't sink completely and inertly into the unconscious. But ego keeps doing things. Um, going on a bike trip with a girl was such a movement. Instead of waiting for fate just to catch up with him, he meets, uh, 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 makes, meets a girl halfway on her, his feeling level. And it keeps him from falling completely into his split. So um, he keeps on uh, repeating to in the dream that he's not afraid or only a little bit afraid. And that means he is afraid. That there, there is a tremendous fear of falling into this psychological hole, which is his phobia of borders, really, and his phob phobias of prison. And uh, this, this is um, really the theme of the stars below. The dreamer had a flat world. Uh, reality is, wasn't round. His reality was flat. There's no dimensions. There's no polarities. Now, this is very interesting in, uh, in a Poeri Turnus. They insulate themselves from all conflict by not entering reality. And so there's no polarities. And what, so she describes that as a, as a uh, not a round world, but a flat world with no dimensions, no polarities. And uh, it can be seen uh, in, 
in any uh, it, him walking in and out of situations and and running away from relationships with girls, never wasting a thought on them. He just um, you, you know there is he does not he's not there long enough for a conflict to start. You know he just sort of tastes it and runs away. You know. So life lacks any conflict or polarity. It's just flat. Nothing happens, really. I mean, this is the idea of, of living provisionally. You're t- you live tan- tangentially to history. You intersect it at only one point. And so you never enter. You don't have a history. You know, um, I used to re- remember when I was first doing analysis, the, uh, uh, you know, they like to spend the first half of it talking about the conscious attitude. What did you do last week? Tell me what you did last week. I couldn't remember. I had no idea. And I didn't have anything not- noteworthy enough to say, you know, so I was, that was the, that was the most frightening part of the analysis. What did you do last week? Anyway, uh, so he looks down in the valley below and he sit, saw that much is being transformed there. It keeps shifting, you know, this soulscape keeps shifting representing his moods and his psychological situation. Uh, Death's head, soap bubbles bursting, um, the the, uh, um, linoleum floor, uh, the stagnant dirty water that has no reflections, and of course the stars below, you know. And so so he looks down into the valley below uh, where there's much being transformed. The world was not round, but flat. His personality is not rounded. And a field, his field of consciousness is like a thin ice over the abyss of the collective unconscious. I think uh, Charles mentioned one time that there was a, a like a barrier of plastic between him and the outer world. So this is, is somewhat similar to that, that there's a, a consciousness like thin ice over the abyss of the collective unconscious. No solid reality of his own. It's just a picture of his ego weakness. In the middle of the flat world, there's this huge split where he sees the stars below. And then she mentions the poem of, from alchemy, uh, alchemy, which is, you know, stars above, stars below. All that is above also is below. Grasp this and rejoice. Now, stars are in, in, that we see in the sky normally and mythically uh, had to do. Oh, and hi, Miles and uh, Cristobal, too. I'm just saying hi. Uh, stars are uh, archetypes or they're nu- nuclei in the dark sky of the psyche. These luminosities, these single lights that represent m- many uh, eyes. So that's what they mean by archetypes. Men, many gods. And it's a it's a um, it's a zodiac with a uh, the zodiac is a huge snake was covered with stars, biting its own tail, you know. And it shows the double nature of the unconscious totality. That there's a dark nefarious aspect, but it's not completely dark. It has light aspects. This is this is what um, really is represented by the age of Pisces, you know the great ocean with the with the mysterious contents of fish you know that's what pisces kind of represents you know what is the meaning of the fish it's sort of this underwater star you know that lives in this dark nefarious place the tail of the ouroboros is um the material and dangerous end it's the seed of the poison in contrast to a real snake and uh, uh, the head part is the light spiritual aspect. And so uh, now we project this onto the sky because the Uroboros above appears at the borders of human knowledge. The sky is unknown. If you had looked at ancient maps, ancient maps were always surrounded by a snake, you know, uh, at, at, beyond where they knew um, where uh, the map, uh, all the borders past the known world were represented by a snake, you know. This this was uh, this was one of the great. Um, I, I think Eric Neumann mentions this is one of the great um, 
revolutions in human consciousness is when uh, Europe suddenly discovered that there was an unknown world beyond this world, America, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, the, this, that it was, the earth was round. No one knew this. I mean, then suddenly the, the whole world just fell into a, uh, it, uh, just, we know nothing about this planet. There are huge unknown, how, ma how many Americas land, lie behind America? Is that the only one, you know? I mean, there's just this idea of, I always had this wonderful image of sitting, let's say before Columbus, you're sitting on the coast of France and you're looking out at the, at the horizon of the sea. And, you know, that was what made the night sea journey so, so, so delicious, you know, that the sun would go down. Where did it go? It came up here the next morning. But what happened to it? No one knew, you know. There was, a, it just suddenly went down under, uh, out of sight. And we couldn't figure out why. But when you're looking out into that seascape where you have no idea where it ends, it's endless as far as you know. It's like looking up into the sky, this unknown sky, you know. And so anyway, the snake represents the unknown. And it's cut, it's both in, in the zodiac, it's both black and covered with stars. So uh, this is the idea of the stars uh, representing these uh, things, the tape. And uh, so it's, it's, it represents what is beyond. And the al alchemical saying has to do with the double aspect of unconscious. It's both above us and below us, and it surrounds us in two forms. You know, so in, in dreams and myths, we, we make, she says, we make the mistake of identifying what is above with consciousness and what is below with the unconscious. But the unconscious is both above and below us. And uh, uh, she says, it's like the symbolism of the house. The cellar is the unconscious, the area of the drives and the instincts. Coal is in the cellar. You know, that, that used to, we don't have coal in the cellar, but they did, sure did then. And there is a fire in the basement, in the furnace. Awful animals in the cellar, and that's where burglars broke in. But in exactly uh, the same thing happens in the attic. You have bats in the belfry, mice in the attic, and where do ghosts live? Ghosts always live in the attic. And who are ghosts, you know? But they live in the attic, you know, and they walk about above our heads. So uh, up in the attic, it's dark and it's full of cobwebs. And, you know, these are older homes. They always had really nice attics. You know, uh, we are a bit crazy, but um, just as much in the as in the cellar, if we're in the attic. Thieves come in from the roof. Demons sit on our roof at night. Santa Claus comes down through the chimney. What's that all about? You know, coming in from the attic or from the above the house. So above and below are um, uh, there. What are there? What's the qualitative difference between conscious powers that are above and unconscious powers that are below? Ab above is associated with the masculine ordered light and sometimes spiritual. The below um, is uh, associated with the, fer the fertile, feminine, dark, chaotic realm of instinctual life or of real life, of living life, of living organisms. The, uh, um, the uh, sphere above is connected with winged beings with birds and angels and winged demons and bats. And uh, it has to do with that uh, sort of a, a different type of world, not instinctive, but it has to do with, um, with um, knowledge that's unconscious, not an ego, but it's there, you know? So it's the archetypal world. It has to do with somewhat with the archetypal world. So in a dream, something comes from below. We might expect it to come up in the form of emotion or physical sy symptoms, such as sleeplessness or disturbances of involuntary uh, bodily 
uh, responses, you know, sympathetic nervous system. Invasion from above, when the unconscious erupts into consciousness in the form, now in any, both these cases, we're possessed by what we're assuming that it's possessing us. So if we're invaded by the unconscious from below in, um, in, in our, we, we have an invasion into our conscious life from the unconscious and it comes from below. What are those aspects? And she says it would be emotion or physical symptoms, something to do with the, uh, with this, with the sympathetic nervous system. Now, the unconscious from above invades us and it possesses us. What does that mean? The unconscious erupts in the form <clears throat> of a collective idea. And that's what's represented by the winged demons, okay? Nazism, you know, some, uh, some collective uh, idea that just possesses people, you know? Uh, and uh, uh, so um, winged angels too, but you can be possessed by the uh, by something that uh, you can be possessed possessed by by Christ or God too. But that's not life, you know. That's not the middle path. So um, it's both con they can be constructive or destructive ideas, but it's collective energy. It's it is an archetype that represents a collective idea which ego consciousness is then possessed by, okay? I think that's, that's it, the possession aspect of being, being invaded from the unconscious from above. That means some archetypal idea has entered the collective sphere and you're sucked into it, okay? And uh, the, which is the uh, different than the unconscious, being invaded by the unconscious from below, then that tends to mean that you have symptoms, which, you know, are usually instead of medicine, you need analysis to cure, but it's a physical symptom, you know. So um, in you're being uh, possessed by a collective idea is an invasion from the unconscious from above. An emotional instinctual uh, is, is represents the below aspect. So on the nature of the psyche, uh, she's now going to talk about the color spectrum. And uh, this, this was Jung uh, mentioned this in On the Nature of the Psyche. That was the book that he wrote uh, that discusses this. There in, in, on a light spectrum, there is the infrared radiation and the ultraviolet radiation. You know, if you look at it, the, the red tends to uh, be, be, represent some type of a heat energy, if you've seen an infrared camera, you know, it just um, can detect in the darkness um, heat profiles of people, of animals or people or anything else. You know, I mean, we uh, in the motor repair industry <laughs> do that to find uh, overheating engines, you know, or overheating motors. But um, the uh, ultraviolet, Represent now. They say birds can see in ultraviolet light, but that's and, and so do fish. I don't know if you guys have seen that um, Discovery Channel with uh, David Attenborough that was just on about birds that see and fishes that see ultraviolet light. It's just beautiful. I mean, when you look at something in ultraviolet uh, radiation. So so anyway, we're we're going to use that as an analogy for the difference between the instinctual world and the archetypal world. And also this is going to represent stars above, stars below, heavens above, heavens below. That's what is also an analogy here. So consciousness is like this ray of light with a nucleus and it, it can shift along the spectrum. The infrared, uh, Jung used as an analogy for the psychosomatic uh, ending in soma. Uh, body, psyche is is this uh, aspect of of uh, uh, something that can be possibly become conscious, and soma is something that never becomes conscious. It re remains below, but is the body, you know. And uh, uh, so psyche, though, von Franz says, is connected with physical 
processes representing the body and it's very mysterious. At the ultraviolet end are the archetypes. Body, uh, from, what it, from within, we don't know what body is. I mean, you're sitting here, it's very, this is what cranial sacral therapy has done for me. I mean, basically it took this great big knot that was sitting here and sort of dis is dissolving it a little bit. Not anywhere near of anything that's going to help me out, but it's certainly an interesting experience. Uh, from, we don't know what body itself is or from uh, without either, except to a certain extent. So the big quest question in this light spectrum world between instincts and archetypes is what is the mystery of the living organism which we occupy? And what does it want us to do? You know, at the ultraviolet end, the mystery is expressed in archetypes, uh, which tend to be realized in um, ideas, emotions, or images, uh, fantasies. And the, so the origin of dynamic images, myths, and dreams uh, come to our psyches unknown, but we ascribe this activity to the archetypal end, which is the ultraviolet end. So uh, a lot of these images, these, um, you know, a, a complex is a cluster of images. I mean, uh, Edinger has that wonderful one of blood, you know, where there's about a million different things that are, apply to blood. That's the complex of blood. What does blood mean? You know, but you can do that about anything. So when they're talking about a complex, it is a cluster of energy evoking images in you, okay? And this is what the word association tests meant. They would say a word and you just answer immediately. They'd say another word and there was a beat, you know? I mean, it had awakened this, uh, complex in you, which has to do with this ultraviolet end, you know, uh, was sort of, uh, you know, highlighted. So um, the origin, uh, possibly these two poles are, they are connected, but we don't know how. So the instinctive and the archetypal are connected. It, Jung is going to say how he thinks they're connected. Two aspects, but they're two aspects of the same reality. At one end is the body, and at the other end is the inner world of the archetypes that sees upon the human mind. And ego can shift between the two poles, heavens above, heavens below. Uh, the somatic processes um, uh, are directed by the instincts, the sexual play of hormones in a body, self-defense, fighting postures, running away, self-preservation reflexes. And uh, the difference between instincts and uh, archetypes is um, that uh, instincts represent the physical behavior uh, in, that's similar in all humans. Archetypes tend to evoke uh, similar, uh, are similar in all beings, but they uh, have to do more with images, myths, dreams, religious reactions of some kind, recurring motifs that you find all over the world. So, uh, so you've got instincts on one side and inner experiences uh, that you experience, not in reality, but in some kind of an image, dream, or myth that comes to you. Your ego just pops into your head, but it pops in from the inner world into ego consciousness. That's the archetypal world. You know, now that's the way we experience it. I mean, you can, you can say, uh, well, the archetypal world is something I study that's outside myself, but it has nothing to do with me. I'm going to study archetypes, but I don't. I mean, where did the study of archetypes come from? It came from, it was people noticing similar motifs occurring in dreams. And uh, so, uh, so if, you meet an archetypal uh, young. Here's where he's young said 
instincts and archetypes are related. He had never met an archetypal constellation which didn't have a corresponding instinct. And then this is um, what I, Tim and I were talking about is the archetype of the conjunctio. It's the mating of the female god, uh, fem the male and female god, and the creation uh, of the uh, of internal brace embrace like Shiva and Shakti. In humans, uh, this appears as a union of the soul with God, and in uh, uh, feminine or masculine form, and it it corresponds to the sexual instinct. And uh, now you could say the same thing about uh, self-preservation, you know, has to do with the dangerous, the shadow aspect, the shadow aspect, that thing in a dream that frightens us has to do with self-preservation, ego. In this case, it's ego preservation. And the dream maker is saying that ego needs to, um, you know, sublimate here. And it's, it's using the uh, flight instinct or the fear instinct to tell us that, um, but, you know, keeps telling us over and over, ego can't help you now. Well, this has something to do with this dangerous um, fight or flight thing. That's how it gets our attention. So it's using instinctual reactions in us to present its images. Isn't that a, uh, fascinating? You know, so, uh, Instincts are what we see from the outside, while archetypes and ideas, dreams, images, myths are what we observe from within. So if we absorb the human from outside, we can photograph what he does, what he looks like, how he moves around. And, uh, and an anthropologist, sometimes they do this. I mean, if you ever read the book, The Naked Ape, it's a great example of this, uh, where a Desmond Morris you know, writes about the human being as just another species, you know, and uh, it's just a wonderful way to look at a human being. It's, it's a fabulous book if you ever want to read it. I, it's maybe a little dated now, but but then if you could do the same thing that Desmond Morris did in The Naked Ape uh, by uh, from within, and this is what Jung does. He in, uh, he in, takes a photograph of the inner world, you know through these images and archetypes and through a dream series with a hum with any other person. He's not going to do it just theoretically. He's going to go through the case material, the person he's working with, you know, because that's where the rubber meets the road. I mean, this, uh, the, uh, uh, the, you know, the theoretical aspect doesn't help anybody other than, uh, you know, just, just a general training on, on how to help someone else, you know, so it's an introspective photograph where we discover uh, the realm of archetypes. So the two uh, are probably one, the outer photo, the man unknown, uh, you, you know, there's uh, the outer man and the inner man, the outside and within are really one, but how it's very mysterious. So um, now we can adopt this idea of alchemy that the unconscious is between the two poles of heaven above, heaven below, stars above, stars below. There's a heavenly above uh, unconscious and there's an underworld below unconscious. So the dreamer is in the middle field of consciousness and through the break sees the heavens below. Now, the movement in the dream is to sink down into the heavens below, into the instinctive world. Uh, the world of reality, really, the world of bodily reality. And one should also remember the little prince came down to earth uh, uh, investigating or rejecting certain qualities on, on the way down. And the Puer Eternus, the little prince and this man were too caught up in the archetypal realm, the archetypal realm of the mother complex. I'm going to try to finish this really quickly here because... Uh, we, uh, I want to get to the Russian uh, fairy tale here. Um, anyway, let's see. You know, you know, she talks about the split a little bit. Um, you know, the um, the split of the canyon is um, 
she she brings it up in uh, in the idea of uh, she had worked with a um, woman who was a prostitute uh, and lived in New York and and she saw in Switzerland and how she would go about her work, you know, which was ba basically not to have any emotion whatsoever. It's all about the money, you know. So she 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 could not either enjoy it with persons who attracted her or be re, be repulsed by men who who repulsed her because that would reduce her income you know so she had to stay in this so she's making this split you know she's trying to take herself out of reality well this is what the polari turnus does you know uh, they take there's this split between th what they're doing and who they are you know and and their life and uh, it was interesting because this woman uh, finally meets this man who uh, was a very um, balanced man, but he noticed that when they were, um, uh, you know, making love that she was just kind of treating him the same way and he became very resentful of it. And then she had a dream that this man uh, descended into a very muddy, stinking cesspool. And he went down to the bottom of it and he brought her up the golden key. Okay. Now, uh, the, the idea there was that he, um, through his resentment and through their quarreling, he was bringing in her into a reality. I mean, he was, uh, you, you know, it's this wonderful, uh, Thing is the Pueri Turnus doesn't want any conflict. You know, they try to avoid conflict. So, uh, you know, there's this idea of the bear who grinds the obsidian stone outside this one woman who was having problems with her family and her husband. And there's a bear that lives outside her house who grinds this obsidian stone and makes it smooth. And von Franz says that's the uh, stone of relationship. That's the stone of, so now I, of uh, the, um, let, let's talk about the Russian fairy tale because this is going to be, um, we'll finish with this. Craig. Yes, go ahead. Go to, yeah, before you go to that, I was just thinking, what a paradox within what you said, the poor Eternus wants to avoid conflicts. On the surface, to say that, we want to avoid conflict, someone might think, oh, well, that's a very good thing. But there's a terrible shadow to avoiding conflict, right? Yes. It's, um, it's basically being an agent for false or for, the, for untruth. And uh, probably our biggest issue in on the planet today is people avoiding conflict but also not having a container a safe container which within which to hold the conflict and i know tim has been thinking about this for a while with respect to creating a uh, a place for these sorts of conflicts to be aired in a safe manner or a controlled manner anyway oh. I just yeah, well, this I think uh, this is going to be really illustrated by this Russian fairy tale. Exactly what you're talking about, Miles. The Tsar noticed that he had these three sons, and they had never picked flowers before. So he sent them out uh, to search for the flowers, and each had a horse. And they came to a signpost, and a signpost says, "He who goes to the right will have enough to eat, but his horse will die." He who goes to the left, uh, his, his horse will have enough to eat, but uh, he himself will be hungry. Okay, the first one is your instinct will die, but you'll be, the ego will be okay. The second one is the instinct will be okay, but the ego will die. And then the, the middle path, the one who goes to the middle path, who goes straight ahead will just die, you know. Now, 
uh, the first one brings back uh, the goes to the goes to the right where his horse will die, but he will have enough to eat. Uh, brings back a uh, snake made of metal, made of copper, and his father is furious uh, because he says it's a dangerous and demonic. It's only petrified life, so he's imprisoned, and so now. The first son, the one that went to the right uh, and robbed himself of instinct to save his ego, is uh, imprisoned by the czar in traditional spirit. And that is, uh, he's, he's entered this father prison. So the next brother goes to the left. Uh, that's where um, the horse will have enough to eat, but ego will always be hungry. And there he meets a whore who has a trick bed. And when he gets, she invites him into it. When he gets into it, she jumps out, the bed flips, and he falls into a, a dungeon where there's all kinds of other men. So in this case, he's fallen into the instinctive world of uh, sexual addiction or whatever, any kind of addiction to money or whatever but there's some aspect of an instinctive addition say craig so, yes this that little story reminds me of a great monty python bit um i hope you guys are familiar with monty python they're my favorite comedians and they did this wonderful bit about that very thing where there's this you know uh everyday bloke, a milkman who's going up to a suburban house and he puts the milk down and the door opens and this beautiful woman in a bathrobe is standing there luring him in. And he looks around and he steps inside and, and she kind of walks up the stairs and, and you know, he's kind of embarrassed, but wow, look at that beautiful woman. And, and she lures him upstairs, opens the bedroom door and he goes in, she closes the door and he turns around and it's full of milk, milkmen. Yeah. <laughs> I just love it. It's a, it's a great, yeah. great illustration That's, of that same story. Well, yeah, he's, he's, the, he's the milkman who is imprisoned in his own instinct. You know, that's beautiful. That's one, that's a, I could just see it in my head, too. I think I have seen it. Well, okay, now we're going to do the final one here quick, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Gary. Um, then comes Ivan, who's the hero of all Russian fairy tales. Okay, now his fate, he cries because he knows he's going to his death and he will never find honor or glory. He's going straight ahead. Anyone who goes straight ahead will just die. So his horse dies, but it comes to life again. And uh, then he finds a, a witch, conquers her. I mean, another one doesn't die. He went straight ahead. The, and he finds a princess and he comes back to marry her and he lives happily ever after. So he chose to remain, and this is answering Miles' uh, question, he chose to remain in the conflict, which seemed death to the ego. For ego wants to know what is ahead, you know, and uh, uh, the, the uh, human consciousness um, is uh, seems to always want to know what is ahead of it but it must be crucified between the pull of the path of individuation i want to start out with this i miss i'm trying to go fast through this but the path of individuation would begin if she um, uh, chose uh, the path of not either instinct uh, the human consciousness must always be crucified Heaven's above, heaven's below. That's uh, can't live in the archetypal world, can't live in the instinctive world. The archetypal world, the ultraviolet, is represented by the um, that going to the right, and the infrared is represented by the left. But uh, human consciousness, uh, so you, you so the archetypal world, at least you know where you are, and the uh, an instinctive world, you know where you are. You're in in the bedroom with all the other milkmen, you know, but uh, the, the way straight ahead is completely unknown and it's going into darkness and there's not a glimmer of light uh, ahead. 
So it, you don't know what's going to happen. So um, it is this uh, life means crucifixion. To rational ego, it seems death. To be between these two poles, the third son must choose what seemed to his ego, the path to death. But in fact, it is the road of life. Others who wanted to be clever, the one that didn't cho choose death, which is in fact the road of life, it's the death of ego, but is the road of life, of, of being a, a living human being. Now, being remember, being an individuated human being means that you're entered personality number two, where your consciousness is guided by the inner world and the outer world equally, you know, and so neither one is an ascendancy and a third consciousness is emerged, which is the merging, the melding, melding of the, of the inner and the outer world consciousness, which is, is sort of somewhat is the, um, is the divine child or the philosopher's stone. So um, the, the, that path that seems uh, young, young uh, it, there's this wonderful book of sayings by Margaret Ostrowski uh, Sachs that she wrote about uh, young, but this is one where that he did, you know, that um, Chris, Christian dogma brought immense advances in religious comprehension. God became his own soul. God became his own soul. The word became flesh. Man begins to awaken to a new reality within himself. But then the conflict occurs. I am high. I am heavens above. But I'm also low. I'm heavens below. And on my right and in my left hang criminals. You know, uh, so uh, this is uh, just this idea. Uh, we'll finish this next time because it's, but I think at least we got a flavor of it, um, of this uh, uh, wonderful uh, images of, uh, we, we just need to go a little bit more, spend a little more time on the, um, this, this, this man who lives in a tent and his, his dream, you know, uh, what does it mean? Uh, for that. Now I'm going to uh, turn it over, Gary. Uh, Gary, I mean, if you can just lead the discussion on the uh, uh, anybody that had maybe see every what everybody has to say uh, about anything first, and then uh, um, then go into whatever you if you have anything else you want to do. I think we wanted people. You, will you tell? Oh well, I don't know. I think maybe we ought to take uh, some you know any questions or discussion on this first. So. You know, so when the, the prince takes the uh, the middle path, he's really going between the the conscious attitude and the and the unconscious attitude. He's and the, and it's death because it's it's tension. So neither one gets to uh, take precedence. Is that the idea? Well, he's he's neat. Let's say this: the uh, the one that was chose the the right hand path, the archetypal. After you know, we remember she just discussed the ultraviolet infrared. Is the little prince? Mm -hmm. You know, it's this one who chose the uh, this uh, archetypal world, and the and the prostitute chose the the instinctive world. You know, and uh, so you got on one hand, she's talking about. On the one hand, I got the guy who lives in a tent. He chose the right hand path, and the other one, I've got the uh, the, the the prostitute who chose the, the instinctive path. But anyway, I I do think that it it absolutely applies to the conscious attitude and the unconscious attitude. But it's a little nuanced, just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, that was the way you just said it. That was great. You know, it makes. Uh... That makes perfect sense now, and it's and it's death because we have to relinquish, uh, you know, certain certain, I guess, really ways of being in order to to arrive at the middle. Well, we'll we'll, uh, we'll talk about that too when we talk about the death's head, the stagnant water, and the uh, and the uh, linoleum floors, but. Maybe we could just go around. Annette, did you have any, uh, just any comments at all about anything? 
Yeah, it, it just strikes me with this split that is the, you constantly have this all or nothing attitude everywhere, it seems, mm -hmm. you know. And that seems to be, uh, yeah, the downfall continuously everywhere. Yeah, that was all. Well, yeah, and she says that that's uh, the clever person, uh, mm -hmm. the one who wants to throw a sop to, to sir. And she says the poor returnist doesn't even go into the left hand path or the right hand path. He puts his money on both the left and the right to avoid the middle, you know, so he bets on both horses. He's got two, three horses in a race and he bets on two, you know, uh, so uh, anyway. The, yeah. Uh, why don't we just go around the room and I'd particularly like to hear from Kevin or uh, Carlos or uh, how about you, uh, Tim, did you have any further words of wisdom? Well, yeah, I, I find this just a really compelling idea and um i heard a, a marvelous podcast a week or so ago on this uh this program called hidden brain that's a, a discussion with a scottish psychologist named ian mcgilchrist and he talks about one head having two brains i'm going to put this in the in the chat so everybody can visit I really recommend listening to this. And it's had a profound effect on my thinking. And, I, and I'm discovering that it's really uh, making me reevaluate everything kind of in my life right now. And it's right smack down the alley of what we're talking about here. Um, I've always been interested in the split between the two sides of the brain. And the way we traditionally look at it is the left brain is more cognitive and measuring and um, uh, uh, linear and the right brain is more artistic and, and emotional and feminine. Um, and he says, a better way of looking at this is a fast brain and a slow brain. And he says, every single creature has this, even way back into millions of years ago, these little flatworms, that every creature has to look at the big picture and look at, for instance, you know, I'm in this environment, where is food? So that's the, that's the fast or the slow brain. No, that's the fast brain function. And the slow brain function on the left, once that determination is made, then figures out how to, how to get the food. We're gonna go through this process and these are the things I'm gonna do. And every creature works this way. So in the human being, you look at, the, look at the situation and you make an instant value judgment. Okay, this is what I'm gonna do. And then it's, it's the, the slow brain that figures out the steps of how to get there. So it's acting on the world that is already evaluated by the, the fast brain, the left or the right brain that has, um, that has made the evaluation instantly. And I feel like this, this really perfectly melds into the rest of this idea that the creature can only operate when there's a dialogue between those two aspects. How, you, how do you process information? You have to make this evaluative judgment and then you have to figure out what the steps are for acting upon the world. And if you have just the acting part you can do anything you want, but, but there's no morality. There's no way of distinguishing one thing from another. Or if you have the other uh, half of the brain, you can make all these wonderful determinations about the value of the world, but you, then you can't act because you just don't have the tools. So, so living is a constant conversation between these two aspects of the brain. So I, th I think it's a wonderful analogy that's being uh, played out in, in this context as well. Yeah, I'm thinking of directed thinking and mythological thinking, you know, where, uh, you, you know, the directed thinking, uh, you know, is, is uh, you, you know, something needs to be done where the mythological thinking is the crooked path. It's not the straight path. And it reminds me too of Confucianism and Taoism, you know, in, in, in ordered time, well-ordered times and prosperous times, everyone's a Confucius, 
uh, uh, you know, but it, when all our possessions are taken away from us and we don't need to live such an ordered life because we've got so much stuff, then you're a Taoist, you know, and where a Confucius uh, would want to take, uh, you know, there's a big rock in the river, let's get some dynamite and explode it, you know, and the Taoist says, if you just wait 400 years, it'll go away all by itself, you know, it'll slowly erode and it won't be there anymore. But anyway, uh, uh, let's, let, I, I hope we can hear from everybody. Uh, I, do you might have, maybe if everybody could be um, somewhat brief, uh, we can hear everybody. Uh, what, is that okay with you, Gary? Just, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Miles, did you have any uh, comments? Yeah, okay, I'll be brief. Um, so, the word numinous you use today, and you, Craig, are the first person to ever share that word with me, as far as I'm concerned. I'd never heard it before. And um, I'd just like to share from this book that I just recently acquired by Jungian analyst Jerry R. Wright, Mystical Path Less Traveled, a Jungian Psychological Perspective. And with respect to the word numinous, page 44, he says, in his mystical classic, The Idea of the Holy by Rudolf Otto, Rudolf Otto was concerned that the word holy had become too one-sidedly light, bright and sanitized. He thought that holy had come to mean completely good. He created a more encompassing, encompassing word. <laughs> Thank you. He created a more encompassing word, numinous. So that was Rudolf, Rudolf Otto. I, I thought it was young, but young picked up on it which expresses a wide range of human experiences and emotions that accompany what he referred to as creature consciousness from the Latin words numen, a god, and nure, to nod. A numinous experience is likened to a nod from the gods that beckons a reciprocal nod from us human creatures. And that's how you defined it. Um, was the numinous is one who beckons. And so I'll just um, wrap up with, because um, I could go on forever, but uh, so I've, we've created a website. I'm trying to always say we created a website because, so for example, when I say we, I mean, essentially everybody here, you're all feeding me somehow, even if you're not necessarily actively participating. Um, but for example, you know, your Craig, your having provided me the word numinous is being integrated into what uh, I'm working on. What Tim said, you know, at some point we're creatures that we decide, oh, I've got to act on something. I've got to, there's something wrong. And what I would suggest we're all affected by is betrayal. So I had a personal betrayal in the workplace where I felt I was being unjustly criticized. Um, and uh, I think that's because, you know, for humans, truth matters or truth should matter. And so consequently, when I'm thinking, well, you know, I, I felt a violation and then I would learn that, oh my God, um, with this Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, where I'm located, um, calls to action in accordance with what Tim just said, you know, we, we have to pick something to, to try to solve our problems, our threats, address our threats. And I was drawn to 49, called to action 49, which states, we call upon all religious denominations and faith groups who have not already done so to repudiate concepts 
used to justify European sovereignty over indigenous lands and peoples, such as the doctrine of discovery and terra nullius. Now, I didn't realize what I was getting into, but you know, if you think about that, that's really going to take you down a rabbit hole into the numinous. There's no way you can address that call to action without you know, really getting into the depths of it. So that's where I say, all right, well, everything that I've collect from you guys and everyone else is, is um, I'm, my instinct is, is recognizing it as important and I need to, it needs to be part of the symbols that are going to solve that issue. There you go. Yeah, well, that, that's a wonderful quote from Rudolf Otto. It is, uh, um, you know, he who stares at the God long enough, if you stare at the God long enough, he nods. You know, that's really the object of, of active imagination. If you stare at the darkness long enough, it will respond to you. And that's really what is, uh, the, is um, now there's the numinous aspect of uh, which, which um, uh, you know, James Joyce called uh, the aspect of, uh, of art that throws you out of, of space and time. That was a, a numinous piece of art, you know, where uh, the, what Otto is saying too is staring at, a, at something long enough makes it not. Uh, Arpane, did you have any, uh, uh, just a uh, couple, any comments? Yeah. I was thinking about the uh, cons our consciousness uh, to be controlled um, of our inner and outer world. And I was thinking how, uh, what level we should reach to have that individuation. Yeah, this is very, this is a great mystery. I'm, that's why I feel a little um, like we didn't finish it today, but I, I would just like to next time, and I'll try to finish a little earlier, is to discuss these, um, the, the, the melding of the instinctual and archetypal, the mystery of the living organism. What does that mean? You know, and this middle way of going forward into death is really actually the road to life, but it also is very connected with the body world. You know, so we'll we'll try to get. Uh, I, I'm yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry, Arpane. I wish we could have done that a little better. Charles, do you have any comments? Yeah, um, of course, uh, these, uh, these sessions recently have been, you know, obviously I can relate to them a lot. Um, I'm very much aware still, um, which, I mean, I don't know, it's a little bit difficult being conscious of it and then not, you know, like, at least I know it's wrong, thanks to Von Franz. But it's really difficult uh, to do anything about it. I feel like my whole life was set up uh, in order for this to occur. And, you know, even my, it's almost, it's almost like I am to remain aware in some degree, just because um, I think my dreams indicate that, um, um, the archetypal realm is somewhere that I was meant to have intimate contact with. Um, oh, and I just want to share this image real quick. I don't know if anyone can see it. If you can go on speaker view, I think you can see it, see it better. Yeah, beautiful. Um, what is this now? That is it's the, the clouds, face of Christ. The stone. Yeah. 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 And um, I don't think I would have these dreams if, um, if I almost wasn't meant to sort of be a where, um, and like, um, you know, it's a little bit, it's, it's a little bit difficult coming down to the ground um, because, um, you know, I just can't, I just feel like I can't really relate to people, um, you know, and I'm up here in Maine with everybody, with all these people and, I'm just like, you know, I, uh, like I, ha I just have no, 
history. I just want to ask people if, you know, I, I just wish people wanted to talk about archetypes and God and things like that. I can't, it's difficult for me to get in on conversations, but yeah, I'm just, uh, just wanted to share that uh, these are, these lectures I, uh, mean a lot to me. Oh, that was a beautiful, uh, he had a dream that where the skies open, there's a rock, a stone in it representing the Juda Judaic religion. And then there's the uh, face of Christ uh, uh, suddenly appears look, looking at him. And then a Muslim man uh, says, oh, this means that you are to marry Christ, you know. And then the beauty, there's a be very beautiful woman there who is not pleased and she goes away in a in a fit because she's saying no you're you're living in the archetypal you're going to marry the archetypal world no you're not you're going to marry me you don't marry christ you marry me you know so uh th there's th this is the idea i think of uh, young young says at the end of this thing he says uh he says uh some guys can't decide what he's going to do. And he says, where can't decide what he's doing. He says, pick one. I don't care which one it is. Just do it. But throw yourself into it. You know? So, uh, but that's, uh, that's a wonderful drawing, Charles. I uh, wonder if you could email it to me too. Uh, do you have color pencils? That'd be nice to color it. But uh, yeah, Carl, yeah. yeah. Try, try to put a little color in it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Carlos, or did you have something to say, Arpane, or, or no? Okay, uh, Carlos, did you have anything? I, don't know. I never look at the chat. So I yeah, Jan has a question up there. Yeah, Let me okay, read yeah, it. go ahead. Uh, Enantiodromia, which is like where things become uh, their opposite. Is that what happened when the tent guy goes wild and carouses? Does the puer have to go through an anatheodromia to get to a conjunctio. Okay. Well, uh, let's, let's look at it. I mean, the, the idea of, yes, the anatheodromia would be that he goes so far in the archetypal world that he's forced back into the instinctive world. I mean, at, at, at some point they, you know, this is this wonderful image of the Earl Boros of the snake biting the tail. You go too far in the one direction, you're gonna come right back to the beginning. But the Earl Boris, as far as the unknown, also somewhat represents that the there's the three functions and the fourth function have joined, you know. So it it represents this this wholeness aspect. I think that's the wholeness aspect, which she sort of implies here, which I thought was just wonderful. But I would say the an enantiodromia would be that he would be so far out in his escapist world that it's unbearable. And so then he he's forced in the instinctive world where he goes and carouses and rape. You know, see, so see, he is oscillating be, in, in between the two extremes. That's really uh, unusual. Kevin, let's hear from you. I mean, it's so good to see you. You look great. Oh yeah, yeah, nice to see you guys. It's just, yeah, uh, yeah I've been working. So it's just the timing isn't Perfectly, yeah, you know, I'm sleeping well, yeah, so it's, you know, two different What worlds, is your job now? What are you doing? I work in IT, actually. Uh, I work in an IT, so, oh. yeah, so I pretty much just work there and, yeah, studying Japanese, that's what I do now, so. Well, that's, yeah. that's, uh, that was one thing you said, too, that you were yeah. spending too much time doing dream work and you needed to spend yeah. more much time living. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I haven't really studied too much dream work. I, I did analyze my dream today, but I feel like I'm getting better at it, even though I, I don't study it by um, learning kanjis, like Chinese characters. It really helps my um, symbol, symbol making function. Um, yeah, well, yeah, that's you, pretty yeah. much it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any uh, 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 any um, yeah thing um, to uh, add to that, or I mean, just uh... no, not really. I just uh, perhaps I wanted to comment on. Um, I just find this um, poor dream very interesting because where uh, most poor dream, they are either flying, um, even the people I know they're walking on waters, but in this dream he was falling down. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that's a very mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what to so. 
Yeah, I don't know how to think about that because Poer is about flying, you know, being above some some shape or form. Yeah. But here he is falling in a, so I know this, this is sort of one and the same, but still it was just very interesting because I never heard a Poer dream where one falls. Well, uh, let me tell almost, you, my Poer dream is I'm, I'm I, I've had many prayer dreams where I'm falling, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, sometimes I can't fall, okay? I want to fall and I can't fall. And so the only way I could fall is I would reach out and then the enema would take my hand. Suddenly she has enough weight to allow me to fall. And then another, uh, my really big one was where I'm falling into a, a, a circle of dogs, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I'm falling into the, I mean, I'm, I'm coming from the, the flight aspect down to the more realistic, real earth. But anyway, I think at least we got to hear from everybody. Gary, I'm so sorry. I'll, I'll try to quit a little earlier next time. No, no. You know, I think these discussions afterwards where we're kind of trying to clarify things are, are always good and, you know, really ideal for this type of group. But, but you know, so last time uh, we were going through and everyone was giving, you know, like their meditation or active imagination practices or rituals that they used in order to uh, grow closer to the self. Um, and so, you know, anyone that hasn't given that yet, and we didn't get through everyone, uh, you know, if you want to speak up uh, and, you know, talk about what you do, then that would be interesting to us all. Like, maybe I'll just pick on Kevin. Kevin, what do you do? Um, to become more whole. Sure. Or yeah. Yeah, yeah I think know. yeah, I think it's following drive. I think a human have an innate drive, and uh, there is a point where one has to transcend this drive, uh, because we talked about the um, we talked about the ultraviolet light, and so we can have innate ideas in the same way we have infrared reflexes, bodily reflexes. We can have innate ultraviolet ideas which is inborn in some shape or form from our past. And uh, yeah, so I think that's perhaps the, for Jung, like, that was it, you know, how can we divorce from the collective unconscious and how can we divorce from the collective um, consciousness and bring something of our own? But at the same time, we still have to be connected. I mean, and so the question is, how do I do it? I know I follow my innate drive and there is a point where I have to divorce myself from my inner drive, I think. And the same way that, you know, I'm really into dream analysis, but there is a point where I have to divorce myself from dream analysis only to go, uh, go back again, but in a different fashion, if that makes sense. Oh, nicely put, yeah. You know, I like that because I think anytime, you know, if we follow something, and, you know, when it captures us, you know, if it become, almost becomes an archetype in itself, maybe, you know, then, then we've kind of, you know, we've almost lost the ability to transcend beyond it, you know, and, and we need to have a way to do that. So, yeah, very nicely put. Anyone else? Arpine, do you have, do you have anything you want to say? I just try um, to be... Uh... Uh, um, in the union with nature, maybe I can say so, and I kill myself, or maybe uh, go to church, and uh, it is also uh, some kind of meditation to to be with you and with God, um, or walk or something like that uh, to to clear my thoughts and to be with myself. Yeah, I think that that connection with nature is so important. You know, I've just been spending more and more time. It's, it's lucky I'm retired because otherwise, you know, I'd get fired, you know, because I seem to always be out in either, you know, the gardens or the woods. Anyone else want to uh, say what they do? Um, can I say something? Absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. And I have a question. Uh, do Uh, you you um, muted yourself, you Andrews. Sorry. Do puers and puelas uh, have the ability to get out of that state by active imagination? And I'll give a couple of examples um, or like comments related to it. Queen Elizabeth I, at the end of her life, she said, I'm married to England. 
So that would that that active imagination, if she actually practically with the help of alchemist or alone, if she had imagined it that way, would clearly take her out of that archetypal Puella self into a wholeness of like the entire population of England being her partner in this conscious life on earth. And astrologically Rahu, which is the north node of moon represents um, ultraviolet color and sun on one side has all these um, earthly friends moon is the body of the human being and all the emotions and venus being the teacher of beauty and saturn looking at the past and punishing people creating well, just going going back to your initial question um yes. and actually just remember this was supposed to be what practices do you use but uh I don't know, you know, it's, I would almost think, I would say active imagination for a puer is probably the wrong place to begin, but I'm gonna throw this question over to Craig. You know, because I, you know, the, I, think, the, I think the way that the puer gets out of, out of being a puer is to delve into the mundane, is I think what- Work, uh, was that reality. Young? Yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. Young, young says just work. Just yes. do something. Enter reality. I mean, the problem is that the puer is is doing everything they can to avoid conflict, avoid reality, avoid suffering. Remember that beautiful uh, uh, lecture five, which I like to spend several sessions on, was just the uh, just uh, the the only way to re to is to uh, to enter suffering. You know, or to, to I, I would say, um, go ahead. Yeah, Charles. Oh, I just wanted to make a quick note um, that the only that yeah, active imagination could be uh, troublesome for a puer unless they were to uh, very diligently make concrete, like uh, maybe artistic expressions of their active imagination and work very hard on them. I would say in that way it would be beneficial but not if oh they're gosh. just gonna let them be like ghosts in the wind really good comment charles and that jump in now i know this is right in your field <laughs> yes and i i was just actually thinking i do believe active imagination would be very healing for lots and lots of fuerz and puelas and as an antidote to the hard lesson they have to learn in you know, struggling down and getting discipline and, uh, you know, focusing on on life, on these, you know, Saturnian things. There has to be a balance and for, they, they have to have a little bit of both. The, the, the fantasy life has to also happen, you know, and uh, as I would imagine, they would face reality jobs like a, a punishment almost or like mm -hmm. something without fantasy, maybe. What do you think? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good observation. You want to make a comment on, on that, Craig? Well, I would just say that uh, it's just a perfect way to put it. I mean, what the, uh, what the puer uh, needs to do, of course, they need to look at their dreams, which I usually tell them, go do something. But I mean, what Annette said is to uh, do an active imagination about the hard reality that we need to enter, you know, or, uh, you, you know, we just need to go and train, develop social skills, develop work skills, develop, and that's hard. It's the Saturnian aspect, she said, that has gravity and heaviness, you know, of, of lead or anything. We just have to enter the world where, our, where we have gravity and weight and doing some type of active imagination on why, what, you know, wh why do I want to be a light being? How do I become more Saturnalian or something? You know, how do I uh, get, I mean, that's, that's what you would do is go question the power in you. Why are you like this? Why don't you uh, want to enter reality? Why don't you want to have a wife? Why don't you have, want to have a family? Why don't you want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, engage in some career. 
Now we're going to get in later too about the uh, aspect of the, that they still they can do all these things, but they don't engage. This is going to be very important too. The fact that sometimes they'll do some of this stuff, but they uh, don't engage in it, uh, or they somehow avoid the reality of it. You know. But yes, I, that's beautiful. Can I just? Make a quick comment, just very yes, quick. Kevin. Please. Perfect. Yeah, Almost I just wanted to. Time to so make sure yeah, it's very on. quick. It's just uh, that archetypes are instinct and they have to finish themselves, basically. Once the output, they have to finish themselves. So I feel like my analyst to exercise away my archetypes was not to deny them, but was to play with them, literally, leave them out till they were exhausted. So another archetype could come and take, take if that makes it, takes place. Finish every that's book. That's not for everyone. Finish every book. Don't start a book and not read it, even if you hate it. Go well, so the end. if we could go back to uh, the original um, yeah. topic, uh, Craig, could you uh, comment on what you do? All right. Well, to... I'll do. It. I'll be very brief. But you know, uh, it just uh, you know what what I do is I it, uh, get get up um, and read you know, probably maybe three or four in the morning I, because I do have a job, you know, and then at around five o'clock, I go down and I, uh, you know, try to uh, dis descend now, not into the unconscious. I try to descend into my heart. I try to descend into my body, you know, as much as I can. It's not easy. I can't do it very well, but I do try to do that. And then I try to interview my body and my heart. And I also try to interview, and I, I, I try to bring the great mother and my soul with me wherever I go, you know, and uh, uh, in my active imagination. And it, it, most of it is dialogue, but I don't write it down, you know. Uh, but uh, I find if I don't, in my active imagination, if I don't, ha if I'm not moving, you know, uh, it, I have to always be either moving or asking questions in it, and then things really happen. I mean, now sometimes I just do what they call, uh, you know, drop, and then I'll have this image, and then I'll talk about the image, whatever it was. But that, that's pretty much all I do, you know, other than dream, uh, uh, you know. Right, so I do right. dreams and active imaginations. If you talk about inner work, that's all I do. Try to do it. I just want. I just wanted to ask if directive and purpose of thinking would be connected to getting out of the poor stage. Because um, the second part of the question I had was like sun doesn't go retrograding, and that. So the reality, the true time, is always determined by sun, but awareness always stays at the present. But again, uh, this. Getting out of the poor stage usually means like planning for the future and staying ahead, or it means like staying very much in present and then dealing with whatever the present unfolds. So will it be purpose of directive thinking or would it be very much staying at present? I, I think it would be a being living in the now. You could live in the now fully. I don't know how you can be up aware. Yeah, I think that's... Uh... That's so much like the goal of so much of the, uh, you know, the meditation, the Buddhist approach, you know, the mindfulness. But uh, I think I'll go ahead with, uh, with what I do to uh, get closer to the self, which is uh, fairly strange. And it keeps, you know, it keeps changing over time. But when I get up, I you do a, uh, a Kundalini yoga. And, the, and in Kundalini, you know, they're, they're basically, they're trying to, you know, to raise the energy from the root chakra. And they do it with some breath exercises. And I think, uh, you know, next time we'll, we'll do something with, uh, with a breath exercise because even, even like what Craig was talking about with the, you know, the uh, cranial sacral therapy, uh, I got my, my massage therapy to actually take him therapist had taken some courses in it and so I asked her if she'd spend like the last 10 minutes doing this and I was like oh my gosh you know because you know in some in some ways you know this felt to me like some of the things that uh, that I do in the in the kundalini yoga you know which is uh, 
probably a lot more affordable for, for everyone as well. But then after I do the, uh, the Kundalini, I, I do a, uh, I do a meditation and, uh, um, and the meditation that I've been working on currently with one of my, uh, one of my yoga instructors is, uh, actually designed around, uh, Kali and, and it's, it's based on a Eastern uh, practice called Shakti, where you basically, you know, you try to, you know, very much envision the goddess and then you try to, you know, you try to feel them and you try to embody their aspects. So, you know, that might be another exercise to, uh, to try sometime as well. You know, I think, uh, you know, it would definitely be uh, you know, a very, a very different type of exercise from what people are used to. And in this sense, Kali is, uh, you know, is a very positive aspect because it's like, you know, she's the one that has the radical transformation for the, for the ego death. Um, and then I follow that with, uh, uh, a Reiki practice, um, you know, and again, you know, so it's, again, it's sort of, uh, all of these are sort of centered around, uh, you know, feeling, feeling the body, feeling the energy, like in the various chakras of the body and, you know, being able to move that. So um, that's, that's what I typically do. And it looks like, it looks like, uh, it looks like we're out of time. Does anyone have any, any uh, final questions? I, d I just wanted to add a practice that Thank I've never done before that I did last week where um, I did a special kind of prayer where I talked down to God mm. and I did a, I did a, a en entry in my journal. And I said, okay, God, I really want an answer to this problem I've had my whole life. And uh, I, wanna, I wanna meet with you on Wednesday afternoon and if that's not not if that's not enough time for you, you just let me know. But otherwise, I'm going to meet with you at a certain time. And I and on Wednesday afternoon, I sat down with the journal and I wrote out the conversation between me and God. And it was totally transformative. It was really astonishing to me. Oh, it's so, just brilliant! You know, I love it. <laughs> well, no, and I think you know, and here's why I think it works. And and you know, maybe we could get some other comments on why people think it works too. But what you're doing is you're, you know, you're preparing the subconscious for this. And so, you know, you give the subconscious a problem and it works on it. So, you know, you're telling God or the self or whatever it is, all right, we're going to have this conversation. You know, you set, you set that intention. And, and, and because, you know, you, you have, you have this, this idea, this, you know, this goal, this, this directive, you know, I think that, I think that's, I think it's brilliant. Any anyone else want to comment? Yes, it sounds wonderful, Tim. It really sounds. Also, the challenge and the the tension. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah that was that was great, Tim. I, I loved it. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, I, I wonder uh, if. Um, Jan, I was wondering if you could send uh, some of your practices to Gary, and then uh, maybe Gary could summarize them next time. And uh, and we'll have to hear from Charles too, if if he does. He does a lot of inner work and everything, but uh, uh, I don't know whether it's organized. And uh, let me just read this one last question from Jan oh, yeah. and Craig, and then yeah, maybe sure. you could make a reply. Yeah. If one anticipates catastrophe, are there multiple line? There are multiple lines of flight. Hang on. Uh, just she just. I lost it because of a scroll. Well. Oh, if there, if one anticipates catastrophe, there are multiple lines of flight always firing off in the mind's body. Okay. Remember last time when she said, if you're anticipating the death of someone. You know, it, it means nothing like actually after they die. So if once the catastrophe occurs, 
um, it is, uh, I, I think it, the situation clarifies because you're not frozen in fear. You know, I, hopefully mm -hmm. after the catastrophe happens, uh, you go out, like say after this, this God awful derecho, we go out, everybody's out in their driveway looking at, I, we couldn't even get it, get out of our, our driveway or our house, you know, but we're just, you know, you got sort of a sense of humor and just, you know, looking at it, people start driving by on bikes. I don't know uh, if one anticipates Christ catastrophe, there are multiple lines of flight always flying off in your mind's eye. That is true. You know, you've got, uh, oh, okay. Like if this happens, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can do that. Yeah. That's, uh, well, I'm not sure. Go ahead. You know, there's another side to that, though, too, because I think, um, you, know, you know, for example, like, let's say someone's resistant to, you know, forming a relationship and they're imagining, you know, constant, you know, and, and their imagination takes them to all the, you know, catastrophes that could happen, you know, and then that, that basically, uh, you know, reinforces their, their behavior. So I think it's, you know, depending on, on, you know, the case that we're looking at, I think it's like a really dangerous thing, you know, That's because, not it's, because it's not being in the moment. It's not yes. being in the moment. It's not full participation. She yeah. says, go there, even if you know this date is going to tell you, I hate you. I will never go on another date with you again. You still go there with everything you have and you don't fear that rejection or whatever. Otherwise, if you go there fearing the rejection, even though she doesn't reject you, she's going to sense that you're coming there provisionally or conditionally, and then she'll reject you for that because you're so, you know, you're 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 so uh, you're you're just so compressed or something. You know, you know, there's some aspect. Of course, you're talking to the probably one of the most awkward dates in the history of dating. So. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, Gary, do you have anything else? Or? No, no. A okay. great conversation, everyone. It was All right. And Arpine, I'll try to answer your questions next time because I have the same questions you have. And thank you, Miles and Charles and Carlos and Jan and Idris and uh, particularly Kevin, if he's still here. And uh, Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Thank you very Good much. You, Kevin. Everyone, yeah. thank you. You look great. And Hello. Matt and uh, Tim. So we'll see you all next time. Gary, too. Thanks. Okay, see you later. Bye, guys. See you. Yeah, bye.